fucking rules. The best way to remedy rules is to read them. And as I said at the very beginning, which ones count? All of them. Where do they come from? Our experience of running races since 1995. And our increasing desire to improve safety. Now, I obviously can't go into a little bit of time on each one of these sections, but I will hit some of the things that have changed a little bit. Um, Liam, they remodulated our frequency, hoping to do things better, and I think it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Rules are periodically clarified. Therefore, Rule 29 is you are obligated to read the event updates that are posted on the web page, and that I send out to the team advisor and to the team captain. There'll be four or five team updates, event updates that I'll send out during the course of the year. This will stress like reminder of what's supposed to be in the oral presentation, reminder where you're going to send it. Um, if somebody asks a question and want to clarify a rule, it'll be put out in the event update. Those are huge. Event updates are the same thing as a rule. So you're you're bound by that. If you write me for a clarification, if you send me an inquiry, then I will keep the record of that. And when I respond to you, you keep a record of it. So that when you come to scrutineering and I say, sure, you can use that system. Then if a judge asks you, well, Prosper, why did you put this in? You can pull out an email from me saying, I would do anything for Mr. Lyons and the Prosper team. They can do whatever they want to. They can put a sale on top of their car. I'm in. There you go. Uh, so you've got that proof. Don't say, well, I talked to Doc during the year, and he said this. Well, you need some paperwork to go along with it. So one of those things. Look for Rule 29 for clarifications. Dudes, keep copies of rules in your workshop so that you can refer to them. Follow your engineering life cycle. And if you change something, make sure that what you're changing meets the rule. Sometimes that's happened when people have come up and said, well, we were doing this, which passed last year, we decided to do something differently, but they didn't check the rule. Rule updates are important. Don't, just don't read the rules once. And don't do it in one sitting, it's too overbearing. And don't look at another car's design and assume it complies with the rules. Some of the cars we've seen, both this year of the race, whatever, won't comply with our new rules. Now, if you have an existing car that you used in 2022, you've got till 2025 to upgrade. But if you're building a new car, it must follow the new rules. So, don't say, well, I saw somebody doing this, can't we do the same thing? No, it doesn't automatically make it work that way. Important dates, make sure you filed your intent to race by January 31st. Your registration document must be in on March 1st, and this includes your registration fee and racing fee. Now, your registration fee is comes to the race. Your racing fee is what we pay the Texas Motor Speedway for the use of their facilities for scrutiny or, or racing. I don't know what that fee is going to be yet this year, but it'll be less than what it was in 2022 because we're going to be there three days rather than seven. But that's something that sort of bothered me, and I'm going to give my political opinion right now. I think from the very beginning, back when the Speedway was originally built, we were the education outreach for the Speedway. And they sponsored us. And they did this for about 15 years. New management comes in and they say, we're going to have to pay for this. And that's pretty much of a shocker because most of our teams are not in a financial situation to, to bear the full burden of what they were asking. So we help support part of it, but the other part comes in from the racing fee. Like this past year, we spent $41,000 for use of Speedway, plus another $6,000 they required to be paid for insurance. Much of that was passed through to the team by paying a $1,000 racing fee. But you see how much we had to add on to it to meet what was there. But I just wanted you to know that that racing fee is always towards what we have to pay for the Speedway. The actual race itself is run by what you pay your regular registration fee. 
you know, well, I can go and go, and I've had a number of superintendents call me and ask me, how come we have to pay this raising fee? Well, I said, if you have a complaint, let me give you the phone number. <laughs> and uh, that hasn't had any good help, though. One of those things. June 1st, your solar car liability insurance is due. That's required. Now, I will send you information in an event update that tells you of an agency here in Dallas who will sell you insurance, liability insurance to use. It's pretty reasonable. But I have to have that by June 1st because I have to go to the Dallas County Courthouse and get you a special license to be able to drive. It's for experimental vehicles. Back when we first started this, I was an old lobbyist and I got the state to pass a law for experimental vehicles. So we have a law on the books that allows me to go down there with your registration for me. I give you your VIN number. I have your liability insurance. And I say, here you're registered in our event. And they will give me a 30-day liability insurance uh, certificate here. In other words, a license. Would you pass scrutiny? I give you your license that allows you to drive. Now, that license is honored in the other states that we go through. So it, it's, a, it, it's as good a license as anything you're going to have. So anyway, that's important. In order to do that, don't show up June 5th because I've already been to the courthouse and you will have missed the event. I will provide the information about uh, this insurance company. By the way, we get nothing, nothing out of this. They give us no kickback, no feedback, nothing like this. And by the way, you ought to know, nobody who's associated with the Solar Care Challenge has a salary. Nobody. Nobody's paying. We all donate their time. And I ask for their money, too. So, one of those things. <laughs> okay. July 1st is the deadline to submit your digital video. July 12th is team check -in at the Marriott here with your full team. You're bringing a copy of your driver's licenses for your drivers. Team drivers must have a valid driver's license that allows them to drive unaccompanied during the race hours. It's recommended you have at least two drivers. So if something happens to your driver, as we did this past year, there were drivers from other teams that would qualify in other people's cars and drive for them. We help, we support each other. Winston, did you have some extra drivers come in? Yes, it really helps to have that. As a matter of fact, in the preceding year, a New York team had um, their kid going, their driver going across the parking lot. He fell, broke out his front two teeth. So he had to be sent home to get orthodontic surgery. Uh, the captain of the Colorado team drove that car in to win a second place trophy for them. So we, we try to support each other on this. Bring a hard copy of each driver's license to team check-in. Registration. We want a detailed CAD drawing showing parts of the mechanical structure, including crush zones, your safety cell, your motor, your controller, your battery, your array, and the no notional driver in a normal driving position. In other words, we want to see the parts of your car in your diagram now. That way we know that we have a red flag going up as of March 2nd if we think that you've got a problem. For instance, if you're putting the batteries out behind your car, behind your rear wheel, having them slung out, as happened to a team this year, we could have alerted ourselves to that to say, hey, we need to do some provision here because that's not the question. You're going to have an issue. So those things are new. We need to see your crush zones, which have been required in the past, your safety cell, your motor, your motor control, your battery, your array, and no show means we want to see the position your driver is going to be in, in the car. The crush zones and safety cell must be explicitly labeled and show both vertical and horizontal dimensions. Dimensions also show the height of the roll bar and the distance between the driver's head and the bottom of the roll bar. All CAD drawings must show complete dimensions. You send me your digital photo March 1st, and I use that to help promote, you, promote your team on all of the um, web pages and things that we have. But you can always update your photo later on. But send me a picture, some digital picture to my address. And your detailed schematic and wiring diagrams show the electrical layout of your vehicle. You need to send that. You need to send me manufacturer's data sheets showing me your batteries, 
And that's not a bad thing. You're going to get your manufacturer's data sheets anyway for these when you decide which batteries you want. But sometimes manufacturer data sheets can be less easy to find on some of these other objects. Well, go on the web and see if you can find something that will provide us some general information about what you're using. Or take pictures and send you some details. You've got to have something for each one of these. For batteries, solar array, motor and motor controller, battery disconnect switches, your main fuse, wheels, suspension, brakes, and steering. I want to see data sheets or something that will tell me about what you're using. If you don't, you will get an email from me saying you are not registered because we don't have full data for you. And why do we do this March 1st? Then we've got enough time to look at what you've done and say, maybe you might want to consider this or you might want to think about that. It helps you. It's designed to help you. It's not designed to hurt you in any way. And the material that you use can always be changed up till June 1st. And then if you've got a good reason, I'll let you change it after that. But this way we get an idea by June 1st of what to put in the booklets. And the booklets tell data about your car, what kind of motor, what kind of batteries, things like that. It's the intent of the race that the solar cars be designed and constructed by high school students. You prove that to me with your scrapbook. But if you come up here with a part of a car that you've gotten from Omaha Solar Car Team, well, I'll say, I'm Enjoy meeting you. Thank you very much. Um, don't let the door slap you as you're heading back on here because you can't use other cars. You must make this your own design and you must build your own device. Um, that's crucial. And the kids need to be one doing it. When you're doing your scrapbook and show me pictures, show me students doing it. Don't have a picture of your team advisor there changing a tire for you. You'd be the one who's changing the tire. We actually had a penalty protest filed by another team because they saw somebody on the race, uh, the advisor changing the flat tire for their team while they're on the road. Protest was filed. Why? Because that shouldn't be done by the advisor. Not unless there was a severe hazardous situation and we found that that wasn't. Your scrapbook we already talked about, your oral presentations we already talked about, the divisions. Notice this, in the classic, in the advanced classic, and in the electric solar powered, we have enlarged that you can use lead acid batteries or lithium iron phosphate batteries, which include a battery management system. Must have a built-in battery management system. It will only allow you to use lithium iron phosphate. Now, if you're an advanced, you can use other lithium battery systems but they have to have a separate battery management system. Your advanced team can have a rate, the solar rays over 22%. Your classic, advanced classic and electric can have solar rays up to 22%. And that's module, not solar cell, module. What is the efficiency of your module? Cruise Division now also has 10 kilowatt hour battery storage. Now, your electric, and your cruiser division must have an exterior working trunk. If you're going to do the electric solar power division, then you're each day during the race you're going to have a uh, particular task to do. You saw the pictures out there. You saw that there was a kid going through a drive through uh, at uh, Whataburger. That was their assignment. Go along the way out, find a Whataburger, go by there and get a, get a hamburger. Or one time, um, you know, we have an official dog named Sonny who goes with us. I said, go find us a toy for Sonny. So he'd have it. So anyway, it's the idea that you've got more of a working vehicle, not just something pretty put together here. Solar car regulations are length, width, and height is very standard. Five meters, height 1.6 meter, and width 1.8 meter. And you can't have an antenna on top of your car and say, hey, that takes me up to 1.6. No. The car must be up that far. Stability of your car, we set out some guidelines in rule 5.1.2.1, which deals with the length of the wheels apart versus how long your car is, how stable it is. But we test for this in the slalom test when we go through scrutiny. 
When a car has to make quick turns to do a slalom, we see their stability. And if their car seems unstable, then we require them to make some alterations. I remember there was a team out of Fort Worth that had to put training wheels on their car because it tilted too much and they could turn over. So they had like on a bicycle training wheels at the back of their car so it wouldn't tilt too much. But that's the kind of thing that could be remedied at the beginning rather than having to do that scrutineering. Yes, sir. Both ways. And we may, may make you repeat it. So you're doing 180 at the far corner? That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, and every driver has to successfully handle the car. And that's where we see that you can do that. Uh, the body of the vehicle requires windshields. Body's not required unless the judge determined that driving without a body would be unsafe. Belly pad is required. Most people like the idea of having a covering of the car because it makes it more aerodynamic. It looks better and you're able to pick up better speed. You don't have a ballooning effect. Your safety cell, the purpose of the safety cell now is to provide a solid structure that protects the driver and prevents the intrusion of objects into your driver's compartment. Solar cars must be constructed of three codependent structural components. If you're building a car for the first time, it must be built this way. A roll cage safety cell structure, you have the driver, that's one part of this. A separate crush zone structure on the outside of the roll cage and your roll bars. And all structures must be designed to help protect the driver in the event of collision. The roll cage safety cell structure is intended to be constructed with heavier material. The crush zone is intended to be with more malleable material, something that's going to crush in. Dimensions here of your safety cells. Required five centimeter clearance in all directions between the driver and the safety cell so that they've got some elbow room here to be able to move themselves. And that we test all the drivers doing scrutineering to make sure that they have that five centimeter guideline. Your roll bar must extend five centimeters vertically above the driver's head, every driver's head. And they can't slump down. They've got to actually be you know, setting how they're going to sit. And to be constructed on one piece of tubing and welded to the frame in two places on each side of the car. Your crush zone is divided the structural component outside the safety cell designed to collapse. Provide driver from, with protection. And here are the minimum distances. This is what's required this year under the rules. Must be a crush room structural component at least 15 centimeters horizontal distance away from the driver outside of the safety cell. Safety cell, 15 centimeters, and at the end of that, that's where the end of your crush zone begins. That's a new limit. And minimum vertical distance for your crush zone, 30 centimeters tall, and encompass the driver's head, upper body, lower body, and torso. And that, if you race the car in 2022, you can have this grandfathered in through 2025, but if you build anything new between now and 2025, it must comply with these new rules. They're safer. It makes it better. Again, I showed you this drawing earlier. But this is a good example. In the rules itself, it shows you the safety cell and the crush zones. And we are really strong about the idea, and I am strong about this right here. Some kind of structure to prevent the driver from being struck from the side and have it hit his body, his arm, or the head. Electrical, you are up to 5.25. Michael was telling us about that. Your terminals and your batteries must have locking washers on them. This is important. One of the things we found of danger is that during the course of a race, particularly in cross country with all the bumps, that your battery terminal connections come loose. When they're loose, that creates a friction. That friction creates heat. That's a possibility of having a fire. That's why every morning on a cross country race, we'll open your battery box and make sure your connections are tight. Every one of your battery connections are tight. Then we'll reseal it. But the way you can help guarantee it is to have some kind of locking washer or something that's suitable that will keep your electrical wiring attached to your batteries. 
Your batteries must be contained in enclosures that can be sealed by the official, and your batteries should be stay, must be strapped to the frame to prevent movement in the event of a rollover. You gotta think, if your car rolls over, you don't want your batteries flopping around until they can hit your driver. Use a nice, hefty nylon belt to keep them in and attached to your frame. Make sure your main fuse has 125% of expected peak current. And if, it's, if you have a current higher than 125%, then it'll blow. You want that to blow and not have what happened to a team where I saw them have too much current come through and I watched all the wire in the car catch fire. Have the fuse blow, not the wire. Main battery pack fuse was replaced first in series off the positive terminal. This is a change. We've clarified it. Everything for the main fuse has to be off the positive terminal. Enclosures for batteries must be rigid, must have forced air ventilation, and no venting into the driver's compartment. All the ventilation from a battery box is going out behind the driver, not into the driving compartment. Some of the little batteries powers all devices other than propulsion, and it must have a low battery warning system. We will test that during scrutiny. Can we hear it? Can the driver hear it? You need to know if your supplemental battery is going down so that you will know whether or not your turn signals are going down on or your horn. Batteries must be located within the crush zones. This solves a problem from this year's race, where there were batteries actually outside of the crush zone. Here's a good diagram showing you the batteries, showing you a high voltage enclosure over here off the positive side, and the ventilation here going out past the driver. Yes. Your iron, there's still warm ventilation there? Yeah, we do. But there's still. Yeah, I mean, it's still, still warm. Still warm. Yeah. Can you the question was if you have lithium. Batteries, do we still want to have venting? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. And the fans for the venting would run off the auxiliary system. The supplemental system, right. Your supplemental battery runs your, your fans, both on the batteries, as well as for the fans on the driver, your horn, your turn signals, your stop signals, things like that. Line. And you can change that out anytime you want to. Your motor and array disconnect switches must be operated, associated relay and contact. Michael, did you talk about your the relay contactor there? Okay, it used to be that all of the switching was done in the driver's compartment. Well, we had lots of voltage coming into the driver's compartment and we had on and off switches. But we've taken that down and now we use a relay where the driver still can throw the switch but it operates a relay back here within the high voltage enclosure. Here you've got your high voltage enclosure, you've got your main fuse, and here you have your relays. You have your disconnects that are still available, but these are low voltage, 12 volts voltage here. And that makes it much safer for a driver. So that's required in all the cars. And by the way, with your disconnects, your motor disconnects and your rain disconnects, you've got to have two each. One inside the driver's compartment where the driver can reach it, and I mean, two inside the driver's compartment and two outside of the car. If there were to be an accident, then if we come up to the car, we want to be able to hit switches on the outside of the car that disconnects all the power that makes it safe for people to get the driver out of there. That's why the two phase thing. Yes. Uh, for a quick question on the relays, I understand that the relays are to prevent uh, both high-voltage wire from being inside the or in contact with a driver. Yeah. So that limit, I think, was discussed by last year at 36 volts. Or, but regardless, some motor controllers, or actually, for a good example, we all tracks a lot of key changes. Uh, they're seeing the circuits to pedal. It actually does run at like does actually change the battery power. And so that would involve a high voltage wire going through the driver's compartment because it runs into the potentiometer and the pedal. So how are, how do you expect that? That's okay. That's okay. We don't have to worry about that. 
We can't fix every problem this year. But send me an email on that, and we'll think about it for the future. It's a good point. Would you, would you do that? By the way, I encourage you to email me. Um, students, advisors, whatever, my email's at the front of the booklet that was in there. Send me your ideas and things that you're interested in or questions. I will get back to you. Um, make sure you don't ground your electrical system to the brain. That's not possible. One of the things we need to talk about on a cross-country race is visibility. If you have a driver, every driver needs to be able to see out front and they need to be able to see the ground a certain distance, eight meters in front of the vehicle. So we will test this so that the driver will be in there and we'll have eight meters and something. And we'll ask the driver to identify what that is. If they can't identify it, then how can you tell if there's a dead skunk in the road that you're going to run over? You need to be able to see within the purview of your driving seat what you're going to be driving over. And so that requires you looking down and seeing it within eight meters. The same concept for looking up. You've got to be able to see 10 degrees above horizontal from your driver's seat. Why? If you're coming to an intersection, you need to see that to know whether or not the light's red or green. So you don't want to have to rebuild your array. These rules are required. If you get there and you don't have that 10%, you've got to rebuild your array or not participate. One of the bravest things I ever saw a advisors do, their solar array was too large. Uh, it was like 1.2 centimeters too long. And they weren't going to be able to, to race because they weren't within the limitations of 5 meters by 1.6 by 1.8. So he sold saw and cut off the last two inches of that solar array. That totally destroyed that particular grouping of solar cells. But then they were able to take part in this. Don't think, well, I'll get a little penalty and we'll go on. No. There are certain things that are sacrosanct. That's one of them. Length, width, height, you've got to comply with them now. And this is another one. You've got to be able to see at least 10 degrees above the horizontal under your array. Now, if you're sitting your heads above the array, you don't have a problem, but many of the teams put their array above the driver, and so this creates an issue. Make sure you've done that. Don't come to the race and say, well, we'll let you squeak through. We won't, because you can't tell whether or not a light's changing colors. You need to see lateral vision and you need to see behind you. This is pretty important because you need to see when cars are passing you. And we will run tests to determine whether or not the driver can see what's going on behind him. Your two separate braking systems we've talked about you must use automotive style foot brake pedals. You can't use anything like motorcycle brakes, nothing 3D printed for a foot pedal. They break. We saw that this year. Two separate foot pedals may not be linked. Your steering and turning radius must be 15 meters, and we're very cautious about that because on a cross country race, how can you make a turn in a town if you can't turn your car in a 15 meter radius? So that, that's a crucial thing for your ability to run across country. Dr. Marks? Yes. I had that question coming in, but I think I answered it in the scripty and the packet. In the rules, it states radius. In the packet, it states diameter. Yeah. So is it a 15 meter radius or a 15 meter diameter? Diameter. I'm sorry. Apologies for that. The yeah. rules are kind of unclear on this. Well, it, we'll be looking at that as 15 meter diameter. Thank you. Thank you. Good clarification. Warning systems. Your turn signals, hazards, and horn, extremely important. Your stop light must be red. Your turn and hazard signals must be amber. Your lights must be visible at 100 meters in a manner to maximize visibility. Now, you might have something in there that's great, but they may be directional. Sometimes lights are directional. And we will actually have somebody at 100 meters seeing whether or not you've applied your brakes. You want people to know that you're stopping. So particularly in a cross-country race, make sure you've got good brake lines. Both chase vehicles must be equipped with, with four Eco 3510s or ED 3511s or ED 3811s warning lines. We've checked out the availabilities on that. And your horn must be 92 decibels or more mounted to the front of the vehicle, but not inside the passenger compartment. We want people to know you're coming. 
Safety belt must have five point lap and shoulder belt with grade eight bolts attached. And the shoulder harness must be mounted so that the top of the horn harness is below your shoulder. And I have a nice diagram here. Here you've got the driver, and we'll, just, we'll test this with all of them. Here's the top of the shoulder. We want this to be attached down here so it creates a system to hold you in the seat. Sometimes we found teams that have their attachment for their belt up here. And that means if you were to roll over, you would flop around and maybe fall out of the safety belt. So we want to make sure that your harness is attached down below the driver's shoulders. And that needs to be for all your drivers. Impact protection within your body shells. Uh, if you're using a shell on your car and your top part is um, detachable, but yet your driver sticks his head through that, then you've got to have a built-in system so that if they ran into a wall, that top body part would not hit the driver, but would be uh, forced away from the driver's compartment. And that's sort of an interesting thing. This generally applies to more advanced team that have gone to using um, your fiberglass or um, epoxy type of systems where they separate the top from the bottom of the car. We want to make sure that if they separate, that there is some kind of way to protect the driver. We don't want anybody to lose their heads over this. And that's what it's designed to prevent. Windshield must protect the driver's entire face. That must be able to get out of the cockpit in 15 seconds. The driver must have a fire extinguisher available appropriate to the battery type. Liquid container, you could have more than one liquid container in your car. You have to have a metal pan. Here's a really good example of the planner team last year, one of the guys jumping out. Got to be done in 15 seconds by yourself. And if you have solar cells on the top and somebody says, well, I don't want to jump out because I have to step on my solar cell before I get out of here, but if we have a fire, I'll step on it. No, you have to actually show us you can get out of the car. We need to know that you can get out of that car. We need your drivers to, to show us that they are capable. Your driver must have forced air ventilation. Driver's seat is bolted to the frame, to the frame of the car. You've got to have battery spill kit. This is traditionally some baking soda. And that's to remind us that with the old lead acid battle, battle batteries at the beginning, there were often leaks. So that happened, we had baking soda to throw in there, so we always give you a small box of baking soda. But on all of your lead acid batteries, baking soda is going to work. Your lithium, you need to find out what's going to work for your battery. If your battery was to break open, what are you going to do? We will ask you that as a new part of our rules involving this electrical lithium during scrutineering so that we know that you're prepared for this and that your chase car has what it needs to do this. You've got to wear clothes to choose. You've got to have hats if you're a driver. Uh, you can take it off if you've got a covering over your head. And you've got to wear protective eyewear when you need it. Throttle accelerator mechanisms. No cruise control on cross-country races. No cruise control. When you take your foot off the accelerator, the pedal must go back to zero. No cruise control. We allow cruise control on closed track, but on cross country, not so. Anything that's spinning that may fly off and strike the driver needs to be covered and shielded. Like if you have a chain that's driving your, from the motor to your um, gears, you always worry if something would break and the chain would fly off, will it go to the driver's compartment or fly out the back? Shield anything that's going to be revolving from your car. And anything that's 36 volts or more must have electrical shock hazard signage on it. And the rules set out exactly the size of those signs. Radios must be a range of at least half a mile. The nature of the event this year is a cross country and it's based upon the team having acquired the greatest number of miles over the period of the race or doing it in the shortest amount of time if somebody ties with it. Um, in a cross country, there are areas where we will not let you drive. There are areas which will require you to trailer your vehicle. That will be well set out. 
So you might drive 30 miles and says, pick up and train up for the next 40 miles because we're taking you through some mountains that would be hazardous to you as well as for your trailer. So uh, we want to make sure that we protect you. Required trailering is not a penalty. It's just our way to help protect you. So that will be set out in the driving booklet that we provide. This tells you what the elapsed time is. Solo car challenge events. If we're doing an event scheduled, then you need to be there to do it. If we are having an evening presentation and it says it is an official evening presentation and y'all go off to a steakhouse and don't come, you can expect a very hefty penalty for not being at a solo car challenge official event spelled out where to be, what to do document. I've said that a couple of times. Our guide for this is the race booklet and the where to be, what to do document. It spells out what we're doing. And that's your guide as to where we're going to be, what time, and what the function is. And that helps you plan your strategy. Uh, trailer, the teams may trailer any time they want to. If you think things are too tough, you can always trailer. We have a great strategy by the New York team. Uh, we were going through a section of Mississippi where you have these rolling hills, big rolling hills. Well, if they drove their car up the hill, they would lose a lot of energy, but they could easily drive down. So what their team did, they, they developed their proficiency of loading and unloading. I wish it was the same proficiency to run a microphone system. Um, but they developed a proficiency on how to load their trailer, their car. They could trailer 30 seconds pull over the trailer, and what they would do as the car was going up the hill, they trailer up at the top of the hill, 30 seconds to get it out, they drive down. And when they got down to the next hill, they trailered it and went on up. They saved their energy till they had some long stretches. They didn't exhaust themselves, and they were able to get some miles going back down again. And it was all about making good use of your, your battery life. That's why they call solar car racing the brain sport. It's about thinking. It's not just putting your foot on the pedal and saying, we're going to go gung-ho wherever it is. It's not. It's knowing what the road is ahead and being able to take those kind of actions that are going to make you the winner. Make you able to complete that day's challenge. That's why we call it a challenge. So one of the things I advise you to do when we officially announce a race route in January, look at the topography all along the way. Know where the hills are going to be. Make a decision about how you're going to drive the car. Drive smart. Okay. One of the things that's new this year is that if you're going to drive this race, you've got to maintain a minimum of 20 miles per hour at all times. If you fall below that, your judge will be saying, get off the road at the first convenient location, get on the trailer or charge, because you ought to be able to drive the car at 20 miles per hour. One of the reasons why we're allowing classic advanced classic and your electric vehicle to have lithium lithium ion phosphate batteries is that they can then now fit in these classic cars lighter weight meaning your classic car should be able to go faster so this will improve the speed of your classic cars so you should be able to comply with this but we've long passed the day when you've got a team ooching on the side of the road because they're running out of energy and running at 10 or 12 miles an hour. No, you've got to train them at that point. Charging during daylight hours, that means between 6.30 in the morning when you get the car out of the impound till 9 o'clock at night. Of course, there's no sun at 9 o'clock at night, but up until 8 o'clock, you'll be able to get some charge. That's the only time you'll get your charge. Your impound from 9 p.m. to 6.30 with police security. You need to make sure you've got the safety equipment spelled out in 610 in your chase vehicles. Your tire must be appropriate. Full brim hat. Baseball counts. Baseball hats don't count. Closed toed shoes. Safety glasses when you're working in the car. Recommended jeans and shorts. Girls must be fingertip length. That was determined by the female interns at our race. Scrutineering. Take a look at the document that I showed you earlier. It's available for download on the web page. Raising fees, two thousand for cross country. Then, don't forget that we'll be providing you with a license plate, and there will be a racing fee, which will be determined by what the speedway charges us. Starting order is sent out. Levels of participation, scoring, team meetings, pretty 
routine type of things. Overnight impound the solar cars and support vehicles. Your trailer with your solar car in it must be kept at the impound because it is under our control and under our security. So don't pull your solar car out from your trailer and take it back to your hotel. You'll be disqualified from the race automatically. You might as well drive them back home because we don't know what's happened. Mandatory, st mandatory stops and checkpoints, you want to stop at those. Battery replacement penalty is a percentage of the modules replaced multiple length by 100. So if you had five batteries and you remove one of them, well then that's 20%. So 20% times 100, that's how much your penalty would be. But if you've only driven a couple of miles that day, that's all going to penalize you. If you have to replace a battery now, then our goal is anything, it's like you've lost that day of driving. Anything that you've already driven is going to be gone because of this. But it's better to replace a battery and drive and be with a race and have the experience and not have to suffer that I had such a big penalty that, you know, for the next two days of the race, I'm giving all those miles back to the race. We don't want that. But if you have to replace the batteries in your solar car, then you're only going to be penalized the miles that you've driven that day that you're replacing them. That's a new strategy. Accidents, you need to report those immediately. Any kind of thing. Any kind of thing. Get on the phone and tell me about it. So we can get medical people there and so that I can know and we can come make sure that things are going properly. If you withdraw from the race, take a look at this. The provisions on section 17. Pushing your solar car has always been touch because if it's during the race, you really can't push your car because that's creating an advantage. But we have these exceptions. You can push into and out of a required impound. You're getting your car out of the impound. Okay, push it out. You can push after the team is off the route at mandatory stops. When you have a mandatory stop, you can push your car to position it properly. That's okay. When the solar car is en route, and it's directed by an official to push the vehicle to protect the safety of the team. You've had a problem, so the judge says, push the car off the road. That's not a penalty. What we found is teams will want to start the race by having team members pushing that car to, to move it out from that. You can't. The solar car must start from its own power. You can't add power to it by teams pushing it. So. This clarifies when you can push your car. Section 19 talks about support vehicles. You want to look at that and make sure you have everything in them that you need. 20 talks about how you overtake a car in a convoy, which means you've got four cars ahead of you. You've got four cars in your convoy. And you've got to have your judge radio the judge of the car ahead of you and say, hey, we're going to pass you. And then when you're ready to pass, your advanced car will flash the lights, let them know, and you will gracefully pass them. And the people who have been passed must defer to you if you're driving at a better speed. Also, notice about drafting. You can't draft off another. This is not so much of a problem anymore since we provide a four-vehicle convoy. Helmets, it's your choice. Not required, but it's maybe what you want to do. In a cross-country race, there are different considerations. But it just depends on whether your head's sticking out of the car or whatever you and your school and your team advisor need to make that decision. All the rules affecting judges are set out in 23. All the, not all, but most of the penalties are set out in 24. Take a good close look at those. I mentioned one, failure to secure. You know, something falls off the car. Bad sportsmanship, things along that line. Important to know. 26 talks about the rules for advertising, promotion, and publicity of your team. You can't use our logo, you, uh, the Solar Car Challenge logo. You've got to use stuff associated with your school uh, or your community or your team. But nothing political, nothing along that line can be used in your publicity or your Solar Car shirt or things along that line. Film crews need to coordinate with our people. Um, the reason being is sometimes that they can create a danger. As I said, paparazzi, not good for solar car drivers. Um, 29 
responsibility to check the updates. 32 if you're going to do the electric solar powered vehicle, and if you do, and some new teams will start off with this. Think about doing something that's neat, something that looks good. We've had some absolute rolls of toilet paper going down the, uh, the road in this division. Think about doing something exciting and um, interesting. So uh, this is a original idea of what an electric vehicle could be. And remember, you have to have a working trunk. It's a two-passenger requirement. You've got to have a charging station. Maybe electric solar-powered vehicles are not the best on cross countries because you've got to carry your charging station with you. Like some people, uh, I know they put their charging station on top of their main trailer. Like this sort of, not a main trailer, but see how that array is up there. This is what they would do in charge. Your charging station, can, unless it's on your main trailer, cannot accompany the car because it creates too long of a convoy. Your charging station, if it's part of the convoy and part of your main trailer, has to decide where you're going to pull off and change out your batteries. Remember in a solar electric, you run off your batteries and then your new battery pack is charged at a charging station. They pull off, exchange batteries, put that in the car, and then revitalized solar electric car moves on and the charging station moves on. That's a little tedious on cross country, not so tedious on a closed track. Uh, dimensions, configuration spelled out there if you're doing this. In disconnects, an electric solar powered car must have two motor disconnects per rule 545. A single array disconnect must be located on the solar powered charging station. That's a clarification. Cruiser division pretty well speaks for itself. Passengers are evaluated based upon weight of 160 pounds per passenger. If you have lighter people, you say, oh, but uh, four lightest people, you're going to have to carry a ballast so that your car must have the weight, appropriate weight. You're given miles in the cruiser division based upon how many people in your car. So if your cruiser goes 45 miles, but it's carrying four people, 45 times four is the number of miles you've covered that day. That's an incentive. If you only have three people in your car, it's 45 times three. Yes. Can we replace people for ballast? <laughs> you mean more people in the car? No, only two people and then on the two you, bags you build. You, yeah, you can. You can put ballast back right there. Yeah. But you'll only get the mileage of your, the miles you try times two. Well, your, your mileage is based upon the number no, of people. No, what I'm saying is instead of putting the other person, no. put ballast. No. No, no you, you've got to have people in okay. Because that's the idea. You know, a family car. Riding along, you know, two little whippersnappers in the back seat. All right. Uh, here's one idea of a cruiser. So you can see what I'm talking about. You've got the solar cells actually embedded into the body of the car. And you've got to have an ingress capability for each one of the passengers. In other words, it's a four door, not a two door, a four door vehicle. We talked about that. We talked about this. We talked about that. And guess what? Guys, we've had a day of it. We've shared so much information. And I bet you're going to be writing me for clarifications. That's okay. I look forward to it. I want to thank you for giving up your time. I love college football, and I've missed college football this afternoon. That's horrible. But it's been more fun having a chance to meet with you. So thank you for being here, and I applaud you for your help.